I always get nervous. I get nervous in my first physics one class. Every time I teach physics one, I'm like, these students are so smart. And then I found out that they're not. <laughs> uh, they're really, they're really, they're smarter every year. It's getting scary. Like at some point, they're just going to come in and they're going to know it all the first day. And I'm just going to be like, I have nothing to teach you. Teach me. Okay. So, hello. Uh, for starters, some practical information. And I, so this is really weird because the last time I taught, I taught in that room and it's, they're flipped. And so I'm going to be like gravitating towards this side of the room. So you all have to remind me to go this way because the camera is only capturing this board. Uh, but anyway, um, so uh, just a, an important piece of practical information. Raise your hand if you took particle physics. Whoa, there's not that many of you in the room. I thought there would be more of you. Only four of you. Okay, well, these four are the sages of like what it's like to be in a formal class. And, and so they have a good idea of like what you can expect and, and where you should put your time and energy and um, whether or not you should legitimately be scared of certain things. Uh, but um, to give you uh, some, how many of you have gone to the course website? Is it on the wiki? Is it on the wiki thing? No, wiki it's, on, uh, it's on my webpage. <laughs> so yeah, if you go to the department's website and just navigate to me and go to my personal website, there's a link to all my courses. And so there is a website for this course. You will want to find it and you will want to visit it regularly because that is where I'm going to, it's where the information about the course is posted. <coughs> but it's also where I'm going to post the notes from all of the lectures, videos of all the lectures. That's where your homework assignments are going to appear. That's where the solutions are going to appear. A lot of other uh, useful stuff is going to appear there. Brad, wipe that smirk off your face. Anyway, uh, Brad, Brad likes memes in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so go to the course website. I'm not going to give you a URL. You're all adults. You can find it. Um, and on there, it has some practical information. It doesn't have my office hours yet, but I'm just going to go ahead and give you the important uh, detail of that. Um, the, the way this course will run, and I guess I, in the past, have sent out an email in advance and said, hey, go look at the website, and then you come in this first day, and you like know everything, and I obviously did not do that, and so you do not know this, but I don't want to stand here and tell you stuff you can read on your own. Um, but uh, just in terms of scheduling, on Tuesdays, at the beginning of class, we're going to have a homework quiz. It's going to be the first thing we do, and that's a little quiz that basically covers the homework from the preceding week. Now the importance of that in terms of scheduling is that I know who you are. You are mostly physics majors, which means that you're going to start that homework assignment Monday night. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold late office hours Monday night. Um, and they are actually going to follow Physics X, which is going to happen at 6 p.m. on Monday night. So you are welcome to come to Physics X at 6 p.m. and then at 7 p.m. I'll start office hours and run them until about 9.30. And in the past, this is just what's generally evolved. All the students do their homework Monday night. I show up, hang out, help people out. And then Tuesday, we all come together and take a quiz. OK? So just, and then there's some other office hours sprinkled in throughout the week. I'll get those posted on the website. None of the office hours are on the website yet, so if you're looking, that information's not there. Um, but in terms of kind of coordinating when you do things with respect to your other classes, because I know other classes have homework and exams and so forth and so on, generally speaking, the homework is going to kind of the homework cycle is going to end on Tuesday when you come in and take a quiz, and there's some explanation about what those homework quizzes entail in the uh, on the course website. Um, so I'm not going to go over that now. Uh, you do have a homework assignment that is posted for next Tuesday because we obviously don't meet this Thursday because this Thursday is a Monday because mine's is whack. Um, so, uh, but that first homework assignment, I think you'll find it pretty straightforward. Uh, the important part of it, which I actually would like for you to do a little bit earlier than next Tuesday, and maybe I'll mention it on the website, is uh, everybody in the class, including anyone auditing the class, um, has to submit a selfie with your name written on it. And then I'm going to take those and make a deck of cards. And then from that deck of cards, I will randomly draw people to answer questions throughout class. This keeps you engaged and keeps you on your toes. And I learned it when I was a wee lad back at Georgia Tech back in the day in a math class. Um, and it really helped me stay, because I'm, I'm a notorious sleeper. If you ever see me at colloquium, keep your eyes on me. <laughs> <laughs> me and Tim are on that. We're gone. <laughs> Tim is graceful. Tim's, Tim, Tim's just like... <laughs> he's like meditating. And I'm, I'm one of those... <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, anyway, okay, so I know it can be hard. Um, and I'll occasionally try and throw things at you when I see you all falling asleep. All right, so I am uh, very excited about this course. There's a book for it, by the way. Um, this is um, uh, Space, Time, and Geometry by Sean Carroll. I heard from the, from the uh, bookstore that this was out of print. I don't know if I believe that. Has anybody looked? Well, you haven't looked at the website, so you don't even know there's a book. It's awesome. <laughs> but the books are recorded order, couldn't order them. Uh, what I'm going to do is send you all a file with at least the first chapter's worth of, of information. Um, this is a, it's a graduate level text, but I don't want that to scare you. Uh, most texts on general relativity are graduate level. There's been one book written by uh, James Hartle um, from Santa Barbara that's aimed at undergraduates. I really don't like the order in which he presents things. Um, I really like Carroll's approach because he is sort of at heart uh, a particle physics slash general relativity person. So the way he sort of frames everything is a little more closely aligned with how I do things because I'm from a sort of particle physics string theory background. Uh, most general relativity texts are written by relativists and so they don't make the connections between relativity and particle physics and other fundamental areas of physics. So uh, this is the course for the book. Um, I think I'm going to assign some homework problems out of it, but I actually I think most of them I've, I've typed up by now. Um, and I will give you uh, chapters to read throughout. Um, but truthfully, it wouldn't surprise me if people had made it through this course without buying that text. Uh, it really wouldn't surprise me. So, okay. And I know you're all resourceful, so I'm guessing you'll all have like some pirated PDF copy of it tomorrow. <laughs> or actually, you just got it like three minutes ago. But anyway, so that's the text for the course. Don't, don't be scared. It's a pretty sophisticated looking book, especially when you start reading it. But, you know, the book and the lectures are designed to kind of um, get everything across. You're quiet a lot. It's very weird. It's very weird. Okay, so uh, today we're going to do like a little introduction, and I always have to make this uh, apology because I go from in the fall teaching physics one where I'm annotating screens, and now I've actually got it right on the board. Although people in physics X know that's a damn lie because I do it on the board there. But my handwriting tends to suck at first, and it'll get better. But let us start with the most important question uh, that we could possibly ask: Why I like GR? Why is GR such a cool topic, such a fun class to teach? And um, I would say that there are, uh, there are many reasons to like it, but there are a few that you might not have thought of. Um, so one, one cool thing about GR is most of you are probably reasonably well along in a physics curriculum. Um, we do have some young ones in here. Uh, I'm not going to call anybody out by name, Madison. <laughs> but uh, but most of you have like seen a lot of different physics, and you kind of you know seen quantum, and you've seen like advanced electromagnetic Um And general relativity is cool because it's a subject which, in principle, is a complete set of ideas that you have really not touched on at all. I mean, yeah, you kind of spring into it from things you've seen, special relativity, gravity, things like that. But when we actually get into it and write down this theory, it's going to be unlike anything you've worked with before. It's going to require mathematical tools that you haven't used before. Okay? And it's really cool because you're all pretty sophisticated, and there's not a lot of brand new things in physics that you get to see. Okay? So I really like teaching this course because it's, it's in and of itself just fascinating. Like The things we're going to talk about is amazing. Uh, but it's just really cool because you're all kind of a blank slate with regards to your knowledge of GR coming into this class. Um, it, uh, general relativity, of course, if you don't know, is exactly half of one of the biggest problems facing fundamental physics, the other half being quantum anything. So the, the most confounding issue in fundamental physics is finding a quantum theory of gravity. And so obviously we start from general relativity and then we try and merge that with quantum mechanics. You wouldn't start with Newtonian gravity because quantum, uh, general relativity is more accurate than Newtonian gravity. So it's half of the most fundamental problem. And, and then when you, when you study GR, even if you just study GR in the purely classical context and you don't worry about quantum gravity and strength and all that stuff, you still encounter some of the biggest questions you know, in all of physics, like, you know, you discover the universe had a beginning. You discover that time had a beginning. And you start running into questions of, what does that even mean? <laughs> and then the notion of black holes, 
well, I mean, you know black holes are cool. You have no idea how cool black holes are. <laughs> Wait until we study black holes in this course. It's going to get insanely cool in ways that you probably never could have imagined. So there's lots of really cool things that I think um, make GR worth studying and are certainly uh, make it fun for me to teach. Um, but I think the most practical question um, that we could start with, so this is kind of motivational stuff and I don't know, maybe my attitude is enough to convey to you that this is worth studying. Um, but the, um, the, the practical question we should ask is what is so general about GR? That is, G GR, and it's funny, um, I, got, I got to tell this story. I have to tell this story. So I got married once, once. And uh, at my, at my uh, what's the, the reception, that's the thing after when everybody eats, and that's the thing they come to the wedding for. Um, the, uh, yeah, I guess that's my best man. You know, my best man, uh, he got up and gave a little toast, and he was like, um, yeah, me and Alex, we met up at CU Boulder when we took a GR course together. And I looked at him, and I looked at the room, and I said, he means general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> because he was addressing a room of people who had no idea of anything about physics. And I was like, dude, you can't just drop GR on a room of people that don't know what general relativity is. So I had to correct him in that awkward moment. So anyway, but I think you all know this is a course in general relativity, so when I say GR, that is the thing to which I am referring. Um, so what, what is uh, so general about GR, and for that matter, how does that contrast with special in SR, special relativity? Okay, these words, general and special, like what do they mean, or what are they trying to tell us? Um, and what's interesting is when you come into it, you, you might say, well, special relativity is, is special, <laughs> and then general relativity is a generalization of special relativity, whatever we mean by generalization, okay? And the interesting thing is, is that that's exactly wrong, okay? General relativity is not a generalization of special relativity. I've heard many wrong statements said about the connection between special relativity and general relativity, and they're usually made by people who don't know general relativity. So the goal of this course, if nothing else, is to get you to appreciate how these things are connected. Uh, I've heard another statement, uh, which is that special relativity is incapable of dealing with accelerated observers, and general relativity is designed to deal with accelerated observers. Okay? No, that's not true. You can talk about accelerated observers and special relativity. Okay? Uh, so what is it that makes general relativity general, and how, if at all, is it related to special relativity? That's the question that we kind of want to talk about today. I'm not going to get deep in the weeds in math today. We'll save that for next time. Um, and I'm largely going to uh, just move over ground that you've already seen in some context or another in some of your other physics courses. Um, and really and truthfully, I won't cover ideas more sophisticated than what you see in Physics 300 today. <coughs> okay, next time we'll go a little bit beyond that. So, um, so in order to kind of convey uh, how special and general relativity are related, if at all, what we have to do is we actually have to step back and look at uh, this sort of broad set of ideas, which I like to call correspondence principles. And the idea of a correspondence principle, if you've never encountered this before, is that it is the means by which you start with a more powerful, more generally applicable theory, <coughs> excuse me, and you reduce yourself down to a more limited theory that is often easier to work with. And I'll give you examples of what I mean. So a correspondence principle tells us how we move from a more powerful theory to a more limited theory and what conditions have to be met in order for that. Um, in order for that limit to actually be a reliable. So the most sort of limited, weak-ass theory we could possibly expect to work with is good old Newtonian mechanics. This is the one that we teach the poor students in Physics 1. And we make them think that not only is this the hardest thing they're ever going to do in their lives, but that it's all true. And then we spend the rest of your curriculum teaching you that it was, in fact, wrong. Um, so this is, in many ways, the most limited case. It applies to the fewest scenarios. It gets the answer 
right in the fewest situations. Um, and when we do Newtonian mechanics, uh, in physics one, certainly, you were just working with sort of objects. So that's a theory that we might call a particle theory. Um, and then at the very end of physics one, like literally the last topic in that whole class, we introduce the notion of a field. And we talk about the gravitational field. And then, of course, in physics two, you come along, you're still working with Newtonian mechanics. But then you start more regularly using the idea of fields. And then you get this idea that the world is set, made up of fields and then particles. And those things can influence each other. Um, and so I'll just put down here that in Newtonian mechanics, we are typically working with some kind of mixture of particles and fields. And um, so now what we're going to do is talk about how we move from Newtonian mechanics, which is really pretty limited in its applicability, to something that's more powerful. And there are two directions that you all are aware we tend to move. Um, and the first direction, well, I'll just let you pick. You want to go right or left? Right. Oh. <laughs> that was so strange. Okay, it was like, it was like, it was, it was a local effect, but like almost instantaneous. And it was on the right side of the room, in my perspective. Yeah. It's like spooky. It's like you guys know what I'm going to say before I say it. So if I'm, so, so if I'm looking at the paper, the right is this side of the paper, but if you're, it's your right, it's this side of the paper, so. Yeah. Anyway, in a minute. Okay, so, um, so one way to generalize Newtonian physics to, a, to an idea or a theory, or a, I'll, I'll give another name for it later on, um, a, a tool which is more powerful than Newtonian mechanics, is to move away from the Galilean relativity upon which Newtonian mechanics is predicated. And I'll talk about Galilean relativity in more detail in our next lecture. So if you're not completely comfortable with what that notion means, we'll talk about that in detail. Um, but just, just to give you a teaser, there is a sort of relativity in Newtonian mechanics. And you know, there's a, an idea of relativity here. And this is just predicated on a different relativ relativity principle. And we'll talk about what those differences are in the next topic. So um, if we do special relativity, then the correspondence principle that connects special relativity to Newtonian mechanics is what condition? Slow speeds. Slow speeds, exactly. So you can use special relativity and get the right answer. And you can use Newtonian mechanics and get pretty much the right answer as long as what you're dealing with involves speeds which are much, much less than the speed of light c. Okay. Now, just because somebody might not have said it in all of your time in physics, but it needs to be said, okay? You can always use special relativity. It's not that you only use this when things are moving fast. You can always use this, even when things are slow, and you get the right answer. That's why this is more powerful. You can only use this when things are moving slow. You can't use it when things are moving fast. Some people get this weird idea. You can only use special relativity when things are moving fast. No, 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 no. You can use it for anything. Okay, it's the more powerful thing. It's just some people think that this is easier to work with. I don't. But some people think this is easier to work with. So when they can get away with using it, they do. Okay. So it's important to know when, when you can and can't get away with that. So uh, special relativity is a context where we, again, talk about uh, particles and fields. So, you know, special relativity, the first time you saw it. Um, well, the first time you worked with it was when you were doing electricity and magnetism, whether you realized it or not, because the electromagnetic field um, and Maxwell's equations and so forth are manifestly or intrinsically uh, relativistically covariant. They have to be, essentially, because the photon is massless and it moves at the speed of light. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but you also deal with particles because you often think about, you know, the electron is accelerated to 0.99c. What is it going to look like to a person standing on the ground twiddling their thumbs? So you've, you've worked with both particles and fields in the special relativity context. And just to kind of give you an idea and to really sort of illustrate uh, this, this limit that we take, you know, one of the classic results in special relativity um, is the velocity addition formula. And the velocity addition formula uh, is uh, stated something like this. Let's just say that there is an observer in a reference frame S. 
And so I usually indicate a reference frame by a little coordinate system. And the idea is that this coordinate system is at rest with respect to S. And then in the frame S, there's going to be a particle which is moving with some velocity u. So if literally you are the guy S, or the lady S, if you are Sam or Sandra, and you are staring at that particle, you see that particle move with a velocity u. And then the question is, okay, what about if you are S prime? Sam or Sandra prime, okay? And you are in a reference frame which is moving with respect to the S reference frame. And the question is, when you look at this particle, what velocity do you see this particle moving with? Okay. And you kind of are aware of the old Galilean relativity answer. You know, if you're you know, driving down the road in a car that's going 60 miles an hour and you throw a tennis ball, you know, two miles an hour in the direction the car's moving, a person on the ground sees it going at 62 miles an hour. Uh, that's Galilean velocity addition. In relativity, the story changes. And in relativity, we have the following result. The velocity seen by the primed frame is the velocity of the, between the frames plus the velocity of the object seen in the unprimed frame plus this correction factor, 1 plus du over c squared in the denominator. And yes, I don't memorize any formulas, so I look at my notes regularly for these things. Um, this is a result which hopefully you saw in your modern physics class. Yes? <clears throat> yep. Good. I like this formula in particular because it very easily illustrates A, the limit of how we get back to Galilean addition, or, or, the, or Newtonian mechanics, I should say. Um, because you can see if V times U is much less than C squared, then this formula becomes approximately V plus U which is the Galilean result, okay? So that's one nice thing about it. So if you're ever tasked with explaining special relativity to somebody, don't try and talk about time dilation or length contraction. That's way too confusing. Just grab velocity addition. It's so good, okay? It's, it's not even hard to derive is the best part. Um, notice something interesting. There's two velocities here. If either one of them is really, really big, then you have to use special relativity. What I mean by that is, if, if this person is moving slowly, but this thing is moving hella fast, this person has to use special relativity to describe it. Or this thing could be sitting still, and if this person is moving hella fast, then they have to use special relativity. It doesn't matter. Okay? You don't necessarily have to have a fast-moving object. You could just be boosting to a very fast-moving reference frame. And then to describe what you would see in another reference frame, that's, mo that's moving at a very large relative velocity, you'd have to use relativity to get the connection right. What's the other really cool thing that you see out of this formula that makes it so doubly awesome? What's that, what's that result in special relativity that is so counterintuitive to non-relativistic settings? If you're driving in a car at 60 miles an hour, and you shine a flashlight in the direction you're moving. The speed of light is always the same, no matter the observer. So if we set u, well, if we set u equal to c, what is u prime? Well, there you go, v plus c over 1 plus v c over c squared. You see it? You see it? I don't see it. <laughs> it's there, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just C. It is. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's just C. You're right. Yeah, it's C. If I multiply by C over C, that's the part that's confusing. I was like, it should be 1. No, it should be, it should be C. So I multiply by C over C, and this just becomes C times V plus C. And in the denominator, I get a C. This C cancels one of those, and then this cancels the other one, and I get C plus D. And lo and behold, the C plus D is canceling, and you just get C. So the velocity addition formula both tells you where the limit, where to look for the limit, and uh, reminds you that the speed of light is constant to all observers, regardless of their state of motion. Okay? Now, by the way, I am not expecting you to come into this class and be able to pull this out of thin air. I remind you, I just read my notes. <laughs> I don't keep this stuff in my head. Like, that's not the important part. Don't feel threatened if you're like, I didn't remember the velocity addition formula. I don't remember it either. 
<laughs> okay, so um, so that's special relativity, and that is one way to get to a more powerful description of what's going on. And then, of course, there is another important, probably equally important, uh, more powerful generalization of Newtonian mechanics, and that is quantum mechanics, exactly. So over here, we have quantum mechanics. And whew, what is the condition that has to be satisfied so that you can forgo a quantum mechanical description and use Newtonian mechanics? Say again. Uh, but, but I mean, uh, if, if you if you can um, large objects, uh, large objects, objects. Yeah. I think it's, I don't know what the exact cutoff is. Big objects. This one is a little harder. Like we have this, yes? Is it where like the probability function of something converges to like some absolute value? Like so, so, so the, yes, yes. And that's not the only answer. It turns out that there's actually many different ways to kind of see the correspondence principle. It's, it's very different from special relativity. Here it's just kind of clean, cut and dry. To understand how quantum mechanics connects to classical mechanics, there's actually several different ways that you can kind of see it. And I don't think that there's one statement that you can make. Certainly, we tend to associate quantum mechanics with describing small things like particles, electrons, protons, and so forth. Um, but it turns out that you sometimes have to use quantum mechanics to describe large things. Okay. So let me just give you a couple of examples of situations um, that relate quantum mechanics to Newtonian mechanics. So Bohr had this really nice idea, which I don't know if, if anyone ever said this to you. Um, so Bohr had this idea that quantum mechanics works for large systems, but the spacing, the discreteness, is tiny. Okay? So one of the sort of trademark features of quantum mechanics is that things, many things end up getting quantized, where in classical physics, you know, I can run with a continuum of momentum values from zero to infinity in classical uh, non-relativistic physics. Um, in quantum systems, you actually have a discrete set of momenta. If you're confined to a finite spatial region, you know, I, I don't want to say anything that's wrong. Everybody likes to say, quantum mechanics, everything's quantized, and that's crap. Not everything is quantized in quantum mechanics. You actually need finite size uh, conditions in order to get things quantized, but, but that tends to happen a lot, so a lot of things do get quantized. Um, and so what Bohr said was that, well, you can actually apply quantum mechanics to very large systems, and what you find is that they are discretized, but the, the discreteness is so fine-grained that you would never appreciate it. So to give you an example, um, one formula which you definitely see in 320, you might have seen this in modern physics, but probably not, but it, you don't have to really understand it too deeply. Um, if you quantize a simple harmonic oscillator uh, in a quantum mechanics land, a one-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator has energy levels which take this form. It's an integer plus the number one-half times h-bar times omega, where omega is the frequency of the oscillator. And um, <coughs> And the classical energy of that oscillator, we can relate to the mass, the frequency, and the amplitude of the oscillation. And so what we can do is we can take a classical oscillator with some characteristic energy given by this classical formula, and then we can just say, okay, well, what if I apply or interpret that using the quantum mechanics formula? What does that tell me? And what we find is the following. If we take a big oscillator, so something that has a mass of about a kilogram, and something that is oscillating relatively slowly, so about one hertz, and then we give it a big amplitude, say one meter, I think everyone would agree that you probably don't need to use quantum mechanics for this oscillator, okay? But if you did apply quantum mechanics, what you would find is that the integer that has to go into this formula, because look, you can take these numbers and find the energy, okay? And then given that energy, you put that here and you say, okay, this is a fundamental constant, this is the omega here, what is n got to be? So you're just solving for n. And when you solve for n, what you find is that n for this system is 4.7 times 10 to the 23. <laughs> That's a big n. 
which means that delta E over E is approximately zero. That is, the discreteness and energy levels is effectively zero. The energy spectrum looks continuous. Okay? Again, this is not the kind of thing I expect anyone to be able to pull out of thin air. I didn't know this. I had to go look it up. You know? so, but, um, but this was Bohr's idea. So his idea is essentially when the ends get small, then you start seeing quantum effects. Okay? But there's another way to talk about it, and that is through the statistical realm. Okay? And in the statistical realm, what we say is that classical behavior arises due to decoherence. So this touches on what you were suggesting earlier. Decoherence of wave functions between many degrees of freedom. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, when you looked at quantum mechanics in your modern class, if you've done that, um, you said, oh, the electron is this really tiny particle, it's got this cool wave function, and I plot it, and it looks like a wave. And then you go, okay, now I'm going to build a person. <laughs> And a person's made out of a bunch of these. And so it's a lot of little waves. And all these waves are sitting right next to each other. And what happens when you put a lot of little waves right next to each other? They interfere. And in general, unless things are carefully you know, aligned and in phase and everything, you just tend to lose the wave pattern altogether. Okay? So if you put enough small things together, you kind of lose the wavy nature of the wave function. And that's called decoherence. And that system will behave pretty much classically. That's why we often say large objects behave classically. However, there's a caveat to that, because what you can do is you can take a bunch of electrons and you can very carefully condition them so that their waveforms are in phase with each other. And so you can actually get a macroscopic hunk of stuff where you can actually see the wave function of that big thing because it's made up of a bunch of identical wave functions so they're not interfering and that's called a is it? I heard it. Yes, that's a condensate. So if you've ever heard of a Bose-Einstein condensate, that's what we're talking about. It's a macroscopic thing that you have to describe with quantum mechanics. And it's because you're carefully setting it up so that all of these little waves are in phase so they add constructively instead of canceling each other out. Okay, so that's one way to connect quantum mechanics to Newtonian mechanics. We have Bohr's idea. And then one last one is the one that I actually prefer, and that's through the idea of a path integral. And path integrals, um, Bohr worked with a very old-fashioned uh, version of quantum, I mean, sorry, Bohr invented the old-fashioned version of quantum mechanics. Um, the statistical version is sort of circa wave mechanics, matrix mechanics, and so forth of the early 20th century. And then Feynman came along and recast quantum mechanics in the path integral language. And that's where I like to usually start quantum mechanics because it uh, it's sort of more naturally connects to things that you do uh, later on in physics. But uh, if you're dealing with a path integral, then now I'm going to write things down that some of you might be like, oh my god, I have no idea what that is, and that's okay, you should go to physics X. Um, in a path integral, what you do is you calculate probabilities using this weight factor of an exponential of i over h bar times, and I'll just write this, the action s. So um, if you don't know what an action is, it's fine, okay? Uh, this is something that you're going to learn about a lot when you take intermediate mechanics. You'll learn what action principles are and you'll from them derive Lagrangian mechanics. Um, but uh, an action is really just a way of defining a physical theory. Okay? You can write down Newton's laws, or you can write down an action, and you can derive Newton's laws from that action. Uh, but essentially, um, when you do quantum mechanics in the path integral formulation, you use this little factor to, as part of your calculation of probabilities. And, and we don't have to get into the details of it, uh, but what's nice about this is that you can see explicitly that when s is much, much larger than h bar, 
this thing is actually oscillating like a bat out of hell, okay? And, uh, and so you tend to get uh, phase cancellations and the thing just behaves classically. And it's when S is on the order of H bar or smaller that you actually have to use quantum mechanics. So the way that I'm gonna write this is when you have a system with some associated action and the action is larger than H bar, then you can get away with using Newtonian mechanics to describe your system. Okay. But again, there's other ways depending on what framework you're using for quantum mechanics. Um, to each his own, it's fine. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. All right. So, and by the way, if you've never noticed, I mean, people who've taken 350, did any of you notice that the that the units of action are the units of h bar? So you know the, the, uh, the action for those of you who haven't worked with it, um, it in in a non-relativistic setting is integral of the Lagrangian dt, where the Lagrangian is like the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. So there you go. The units of kinetic energy are, or the dimensions of kinetic energy are. At yeah, joules times time, and that's the units of H bar. Okay, so I mean, this comparison would make no sense if they had different units. That I hope that's obvious. Like, you know, is three pounds bigger than two meters? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. What, what world? What, what, who would want to live in that world where three pounds is smaller than two meters? <laughs> Actually, you know, that's, it's a, it's a, it actually is kind of a comparison you can make, right? Because we have in our mind characteristic densities. And so you could kind of say, this volume should be associated with roughly this mass, you know, for, for densities we tend to encounter. And so you can translate between volume, volume, not length, but volume and densities. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we have taken the Newtonian mechanics and we have moved in two directions. We have gone small for lack of a better word and we have gone fast for lack of a better word but what can we also do we can go small and fast exactly we can take both of these and ask well what happens if i go describe something really small that's also moving really fast and does anybody know what the appropriate description in that case is what is the tool that we need to use in that case? General relativity. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> we would use, for lack of a better name, relativistic quantum mechanics. <laughs> right? Relativistic quantum mechanics. Um, which is what this stands for. So, um, <laughs> Relativistic quantum mechanics. <laughs> this is just in French. Um, no. So what you find when you try and do when you try and smash these two things together, um, you have a problem. And the problem is actually based on something that you all are somewhat aware of. Okay. So most of you are probably aware of the problem here. You're all, I hope, aware of the problem here. But the problem. So, so one thing that happens in quantum mechanics, and this is something which you're only going to understand if you've taken 320, is that when you do quantum mechanics, one of the most important steps you always have to take is to normalize your wave function, right? You got to normalize that wave function. What's the use of a wave function if it's not normalized? Why do we have to normalize the wave function? Because it exists once. Because we're describing something that exists. <laughs> and if it exists, then the, norm, the, the wave function has to be normalized. You integrate over all space and you say, it's somewhere. <laughs> the probability of looking over the entire universe and finding that electron I'm talking about is one. Because it's got to be in the universe somewhere. So we have wave function normalization. Okay, That's sort of a key step in quantum mechanics, at least as you've learned it. But then in special relativity, we end up with this brand new ingredient, which is to say that an electron is not forever. Electrons can disappear, right? We learned that you can take things like electrons and positrons, and you can combine them to form photons. You can actually have particles disappear and be created. Well, these are at odds with each other because, you know, our whole structure of doing quantum mechanics is based on saying, 
the things exist and they remain in existence. And here you're saying, oh, things can pop in and out. Okay? So you can actually take these two things and you can just sort of brute force make them go together and you have to kind of find a workaround to make these things compatible. But it turns out that there's an incredibly elegant way to get them to work together where these two things are accommodated naturally and that is through quantum field theory. Okay? And quantum field theory is, if it's not obvious, a theory in which you say everything is fields, there are no particles. Quantum field theory is, of course, the context where you do particle physics. And if you, you know, have the time and interest and you take my particle physics class, we will look at results from quantum field theory. It's not a class in quantum field theory. This is actually a very big subject that's usually taught at the graduate level at best. Um, but quantum field theory is basically a successful marriage of quantum mechanics and special relativity, but you do have to sort of change, and by the way, I should say here you use this for particles and fields. When you do quantum field theory, you're only using a description in terms of fields. Okay? Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about that. And now we notice something. On the board, I have special relativity in this web of correspondences. Does anyone see general relativity up there? There's the word general up top. There's also relativity. There's also oh. yeah, relativity. <laughs> <laughs> Your card is going to earn special plates on the top of the day. Every single Tuesday and Thursday. No, okay. So true, the words general relativity. <laughs> but is the is the idea the physics of general relativity anywhere in this scheme? It's not. Okay. So we we've sort of accommodated going fast, and we've accommodated getting small. We talk about getting big, going this way. We talk about going slow, going this way, and then we can kind of combine the two efforts. Um, so clearly, general relativity doesn't fit into this scheme. So where does general relativity arise? Okay. So um, to really get at where general relativity fits into the picture, the thing that I have to point out to you is something about the four things that I've written up here, which might not be obvious, but I have actually spelled this out to students who've taken my particle physics class. And the idea that I'm about to espouse is by no means universal. You could say this to a faculty member who's like, I don't know what the hell Foreman was talking about. I don't think of it that way. And that's fine, but I'm just going to give you the ways that I have organized the physics in my head, which helps me make sense of the deep ideas. Um, all of these things are frameworks for doing physics. And in a contrast to what I have written there, um, they are not theories, even though this is often called quantum field theory. Now, what do I mean by a framework? What I mean by a framework is these are basically a set of rules that you throw physics into. And you say, OK, what does this particular physics do if I use special relativity to work with it, or if I use quantum mechanics, or if I want to do relativistic quantum mechanics? So for example, uh, what do I mean by physics? Well, I could say you know, electromagnetism. That's physics. I could treat electromagnetism in this context. I could treat electromagnetism in this context. And what I mean by that, you might be like, wait a minute, the photon's massless. It's got to be real. I'm, I'm talking about the electron itself, the particle that the electromagnetic fields move. And so if that electron is moving very, very slowly, then I could try and apply Newtonian mechanics. Or if I let the electron move fast, I might get a better description with special relativity. But since the electron's small, I might actually should be using quantum mechanics. Or I could describe electromagnetism with this. Okay? But I could pick a different force. I could pick, say, the strong interaction, and I could do all this with the strong interaction. I could just make up some whack force, and then I could see, okay, well, what does the physics of that force look like if I work with these different frameworks? Notice, in what you're seeing up here, there are no forces intrinsic in the definitions that I've provided. You introduce the physics and the forces into these frameworks, and then you use the frameworks to work things out. A theory... is a framework plus 
a set of degrees of freedom, which is fancy talk for the particles or fields that you're going to allow, plus their interactions, that is, forces. So again, electromagnetism is saying I'm going to allow for you know, charged particles and photons, and then there's an interaction in terms of the electromagnetism. And then if I do electromagnetism in the quantum mechanical framework, then I'm dealing with a theory. Okay. So a theory is a combination of a framework and the stuff you're putting into it. Okay. And now here's the punchline. GR is a theory. So the burning question is, if I get a theory by taking a framework and introducing some interactions, what interaction am I introducing into which framework to do GR? Well, what interaction do you think GR is associated with? Gravity. Gravity. General relativity is the theory of gravity. So you're talking about the gravitational force, but you're not doing gravity in a Newtonian framework. You did that in physics one, okay? You are trying to do gravity in a relativistic framework, okay? Now just doing gravity in a relativistic framework, just plopping general, or gravity into this framework, in and of itself is not gonna get you where general relativity ends up because it turns out that trying to just dump it whole hog into here leads you to a lot of inconsistencies. So the, the beauty and the power of what Einstein actually achieved was successfully getting a relativistic theory of gravity. And it really requires you to go back and rethink the fundamentals. And you are all aware that you get some really whack ideas, you know, curvature of space-time and gravity is a manifestation of that, okay? So when we say the word general relativity, and we ask, what is it a generalization of? It's not a generalization of special relativity. It's a generalization of Newtonian gravity. Okay. That is what is so general about general relativity. It is a theory which generalizes this theory. Okay? And to the degree that it connects two frameworks, it connects this framework to this framework, there should be a correspondence. And there is. So what you find is that if the mass of the system in question over the characteristic length of the system in question, so this could be a planet and this is the mass and the radius of the planet, if that ratio is much larger, or is larger, yeah, is larger than c squared over g, then you need, then you need to use gr. Conversely, if the mass of the radius is much less than this, then you can get away with Newtonian gravity. Okay, so there is a correspondence between when you need to use GR and when you can get away with Newtonian gravity. Notice I'm not saying there's a correspondence between when you need GR and when you need special relativity, because that's not what gets connected. It's general relativity and good old Newtonian gravity, which is what you do in physics 100. Okay. All right, so um, now, there is a, a sense in which GR is kind of connected to special relativity, right? If I put gravity in this framework, then I end up getting to GR, and then that's a correspondence related to gravity in this framework, which is Newtonian gravity. But what we'll discover in studying GR is that special relativity and GR are actually related. Um, go back to the page of them. Um, they're actually related in a slightly different way. Um, 
and 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 well, actually, they're related in a couple different ways. But uh, but to, just to, to be honest, um, what we're going to find eventually is that when we do general relativity, one of the key things that makes general relativity different from any other physics you've ever done is that in any other physics you've ever done, you started out by saying space-time is this. And then you do physics on space-time. General relativity is a theory where you start out where space-time is unknown. And then you solve the theory to find what the space-time is. Okay? And we'll learn how to do that and what all that means and what all it entails in time. But, at this point, what I can say is that special relativity is actually a solution of general relativity. So there's another way in which they're connected that has nothing to do with the correspondence principle. Okay? And you'll understand what I mean by special relativity as a solution of general relativity um, in due time. And there's actually also another beautiful connection between these two, which is, uh, which is a little more obvious to people who have taken particle physics, but I'll try and spell it out in a later lecture. And that is that you can arrive at general relativity by starting from special relativity and using something called a gauge principle. And by trying to gauge the symmetries of special relativity, you will end up with general relativity in much the same way we build the standard model from gauge principles. If any of those words don't mean anything to you, it's fine. That's stuff we cover in, in particle physics. And like I said, I'll try and touch on it in a, letter, in a lecture much, much later in the course. Okay, so I, I just, I want to be honest, I don't want you to think this is the only way GR gets connected to things, okay? But I, I really want you to understand that when Einstein was developing the theory, what he was doing was taking gravity and thinking about gravity and trying to generalize gravity. Okay, so questions to this point? Yes? Is there a theory which generalizes like uh, the combination of quantum mechanical gravity and GR to make the quantum field theory gravity. <laughs> so like so like this this is Newtonian gravity is like goes to, connects to GR. Is there a combination of that and quantum mechanics to make something for quantum field theory? Uh <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, 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 so, um, let me say the following. Um, so, no one does it, but you can. You could, and then, uh, maybe this would be an interesting senior design project, but why the hell do you do that? Uh, you could try to do a quantum mechanical treatment of Newtonian gravity. Just to, to start, like baby steps. Yeah. So do Newtonian gravity, but just go this way. Then you're doing quantum Newtonian gravity, or sorry, you're doing quantum, well, it's Newtonian gravity because it's not GR, but it's not Newtonian because you're doing quantum mechanics. I don't have a good name for it. That's because nobody's done it, nobody's made a name for it. The reason no one does that, right, is because normally gravity is only important when things are big, but that's exactly when quantum mechanics is not important. Oh. You know, literally, if you're talking about electrons, you can ignore the gravitational interaction between them all together. Oh. The electromagnetic interaction is way more important. But nonetheless, you can do it. <laughs> you can take Newtonian gravity, treat it quantum mechanically, and then you would have this no-name theory, which you can just apply your own name to. I don't know if you want that kind of fame. And then from that theory, you can ask, okay, what if I also went this way and relativized it? What would I end up with here? Or if you went this way to uh, general relativity, and then you just said, okay, I got a relativistic theory of gravity, and then I want to consider what it's like when I throw quantum mechanics at it, and then the replacement here is that we don't know. Okay. okay. But, I mean, yeah, string theory is a contender, and there are other options out there, but that's like, we don't know yet. Okay. I wish we did. Um, that's what Physics X is all about, by the way. So if you're curious about that, 6 o'clock, Monday nights. Um, other questions? Are you in the right place? I don't know. I think that room 140 for your blowing switch today. For what? Uh, yeah, the... Yeah, it all just walked in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine, you're fine. You're welcome to stay. Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> some pretty <laughs> elementary stuff we're covering today. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine, that's fine. Um, she had that look. I don't think I'm in the right book. Okay. <laughs> Other questions before I erase all this stuff? Okay, good. Oh, man. And I have to say, like, for me, when I was an undergraduate, I, no one ever gave me, like, these sort of lectures where they kind of laid out the scope of things and how things are connected. And that was actually something that I really had to figure out on my own when I was studying string theory, because obviously in string theory, like, you're down here. You know, you've got to figure out all the paths to get there. And, and I feel like it's, even if you don't know the ins and outs of quantum mechanics yet or quantum field theory, like, just to have an idea of how all of these different tools you're using in physics are connected, I think is very valuable. Um, okay, so we're going to be, throughout the course, developing a relativistic generalization of Newtonian gravity, okay? And um, that is cool. <laughs> So, what I want to do now, yeah, what I want to do now is actually give you an idea of what that looks like. Because uh, if you're sitting there staring down the neck of something that is brand new, again, I said, you've never done anything like this before, uh, that could be a pretty daunting task. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to frame it in contrast to something that you should all be relatively familiar with. Okay? I'm literally going to lay out general relativity for you right here, right now, in terms of something you're familiar with. Okay? So here we go. If I'm going to throw this down in terms of something you're familiar with, I need to be thinking in terms of a theory. Okay? So the theory that I'm going to work with is the following. Good old electrodynamics. So, you are familiar with some of the important relations in electrodynamics. And I'm aware that many of you might have only seen these in their integral form, and that's okay. Anytime you write down an integral equation, you can turn it into a differential equation just by taking the derivative of both sides. Okay, what are these called? Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations. Okay, you saw those in, in Physics 200. Maybe only in their integral form, but again, you can write them in their differential form. I don't remember. Is it sitting in? Um, should it be the bottom one be del cross b? Not del dot b. No, the second one should be del cross b. Oh. Yeah, you're right. This one should be del cross b. And uh, once again, I do not carry these right in my head. I do carry around their relativistic tensor generalizations because they're so easy. But these I don't ever carry around in my head. Um, but what I do carry around in my head is the following. These things are the equations of motion of the electric and magnetic fields. That is, if you were given a Lagrangian for electromagnetism, and I might be using words that some of you don't know, it's okay. We won't, we won't worry about this. But if I gave you the Lagrangian of electromagnetism and said, hey, what are the Euler-Lagrange equations for E and B? These are the equations you would derive. Which leaves the question, what are these? Any takers? You have all studied electromagnetism, yes? You have all seen four Maxwell's equations, yes? Surely the professors of your electromagnetism classes told you that these are equations of motion and these are something else, correct? No. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I know, it pains me. That this, I know you don't know the answer and that's why it pains Not because you should know, because you should have been told. But anyway, yes? Um, doesn't it have to do between like, like the relativity of them? Unless the word Bianchi identity were about to come out of your mouth now. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's fine. Like, the, to, to actually explain these things requires some relatively sophisticated terminology. Uh, one way that you've actually seen this is that the consequence of these equations is that you can write things in terms of potentials. But that's actually sort of the, the cursory way of appreciating these. These are actually conditions which are 
conditions imposed on the electromagnetic geometry of the fiber bundle structure underlying the UN gauge theory of electromagnetism. That's stuff you don't need to worry about. But these are actually geometric conditions. And when I say geometric, well, what the hell do you mean? Well, there's a way you can geometrize electromagnetism. And in fact, they also carry information about the topological conditions of the geometry. So for example, if you screw up the space on which you're doing electromagnetism in the right way, then you can introduce monopoles, magnetic monopoles, and that screws up these equations, as you're well aware. Okay. So anyway, there's equations of motion, there's the Bianchi identities, and altogether these give us Maxwell's equations. And that is probably about one half of electromagnetism, right? Okay, because that's not the whole thing. Like, you know, what do Maxwell's equations tell us? This is something I used to tell my optics students during field session, but I haven't taught that in a long time. What do Maxwell's equations tell us? Like, what do they what are they used for? <laughs> of course, they're used for electromagnetism. But what in electromagnetism do you do with Maxwell's equations? Fields. What about fields? Uh, how fields behave. How fields behave uh, in relation to particles. In relation to. In free space. In free space, but you can also consider them not in free space. You don't have to consider them in free space. Because you have these J's and these rows. So, like, holistically, what are Maxwell's equations telling you? <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm not upset with you. I think somebody should have said this to you when they were teaching you electromagnetism. Maybe I'll say this and you'll go, maybe I'll say this and you'll go, oh, I know, I knew that. I maybe you should teach Viz too. <laughs> and then also intermediate. <laughs> we didn't have that <laughs> They tell us how sources create fields. Sources, literally. I mean, I, I thought you might go, yeah, I knew that. But that's what they are. But it, this is a very important observation when I compare it to general relativity. The sources are the rows and the j's, and to a degree, the time-varying e's and b's. But what do you do? You give me a set of sources. I solve these equations in the presence of those sources to find the e and the b field. OK? So we have sources that create fields, and that's basically half of electromagnetism. What's the other half? When the fields work themselves. How the what? When the fields are only attracting these themselves. Well, that's actually incorporated in this idea here. L literally, you have there's another part of electromagnetism in addition to these equations. This isn't the whole story. How the fields affect the sources or the particles? How the fields affect the particles. Okay. So what do we do when we do electromagnetism? We take big sources, like big currents or capacitor plates. We solve for the fields they create. And then we take a little test particle and we put it in there and we go, how does it go? <laughs> and how, what do we use to describe how the particle responds to the, for, to the fields? Well, essentially it's all contained in the Lorentz force law. Is that what you were going to say? I was going to say we're going to find the potentials. Well, the, the potentials are part of describing the fields. But, so what I have in mind is I have taken some sources and they have created fields. And now I want to forget about those sources. I just say, I've got these fields there, and I want to take this little charged particle and stick it in there, and maybe let it move, and say, what happens to it? Okay, does that make sense? Like, that's a question we, this is actually the canonical thing we do in electromagnetism. We create fields somehow, and then we let those fields interact with, or impress their influence upon small particles. So to this, we add the Lorentz force law to get the electromagnetic force. But that's not enough, because we have to know, well, how does that force actually affect the behavior of the particle? And for that, we just use good old F equals MA. Okay? And so the second half of electromagnetism is how forces how fields influence uh, particles. Okay. So, I mean, uh, again, like, you know, when you talk about the hydrogen atom, you take the proton and you say the proton creates this electromagnetic field. 
And then you ignore the proton and you just say there's the proton's electro electric field if it's sitting still. And then you say I'm going to stick an electron in it and how is the electron going to react to the electric field of the proton. And you do that because you know that the proton is so massive in comparison that it's just going to sit there and not do much. And the electron is the one that's going to do all the love. Okay? So there's this split that we use a lot in physics where we use big things to create backgrounds and then we use small things like test particles in the presence of these backgrounds and we say what do they do? We don't have to do that, right? I mean, in principle, you can take two electrons in the empty universe and say, what do they do? Well, this one creates an electric field that this one interacts with, but this one also creates an electric field that this one interacts with, and they both move, and it gets really complicated. That's a two-body problem, but you can do it. But in practice, we usually do this. We think of something big that doesn't really respond. It creates fields, and then we look at something really small whose own fields we can ignore. So is everybody roughly familiar with having done this at some level in electromagnetism? Good. All right, so general relativity mirrors this. In general relativity, what we have is the following. Analogous to Maxwell's equations, we have what are called Einstein's equations. Or you might call it Einstein's equation. Depends on what language you want to say. You know, in principle, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these. There's only one of these, but it has 256 components. So <laughs> oh, you could put an S on there if you want. Most people <laughs> do. But um, so there's Einstein's equation. And what Einstein's equation tells us is how sources create gravitational fields or curvature. Okay? Now I want to be a little bit careful because I just used the word field and many of you are like, oh, the gravitational field, I know what that is, that's something I learned in physics one. We are not going to talk about the gravitational field in this class. Okay? There is no gravitational field in this class. What there is, is there is the curvature of space-time. That's going to play the role of what you used to think of as the gravitational field. Okay? But we are going to talk about a field in this class that is truly a field. Okay? And it's going to be a very, very important part of general relativity. So that's what I mean when I say gravitational field here. It is a field, but it's not like the Newtonian gravity field that you saw at the end of Physics 1 and that you've worked with in other contexts. So this thing we will eventually learn, technically, is what is called the metric field. And the metric field is exactly a quantity which describes the geometry of space-time including its curvature, okay? So there is a sense in which Maxwell's equations, and I, I, I wasn't just being like showy when I was using these fancy words earlier about geometry, but there's a, a sense in which Maxwell's equations tell us how sources create electromagnetic geometry, and in general relativity, Einstein's equation tells us how sources literally create space-time geometry. And, and we're going to have to develop some tools to even understand how you describe that, and we will. But just like there is a second half to electromagnetism, there is a second half to general relativity. Okay? Now, you know, before we go this way, let's just come over here. So we've kind of learned this part of the general relativity story. That's going to be Einstein's equations, which tell us how big things create curvature. And now what we want to talk about is in general relativity, what how do you describe a small thing placed in the curvature that was created by the big thing? Now, this is incredibly important because, right, in this scenario, in general relativity, we usually are dealing with big things, like planets and stars and the entire universe. That's about as big as you can get, okay? But then you want to talk about 
you got a planet, it's created this curvature, how does a satellite move in the context of that curvature? Or the sun creates a geometry, how does the very tiny Earth in comparison move in the curvature created by the sun? So in general relativity, you're almost always dealing with this split between big and small. There are exceptions, black hole binaries, that's a great exception. You know, these two things are merging, they're both equal, roughly equal size, it's a hell of a hard problem. But generally, we can get away with looking at big things and then separating out the small things. So the analogous part of general relativity to this is something really cool. And that is something we refer to as the geodesic equation, which bears no resemblance whatsoever to this. But the geodesic equation tells us how test particles respond to curvature. Now, how many of you have seen the word geodesic before? What does it mean? Shortest path. It means shortest path in most contexts. What you're going to learn is that the word geodesic can be applied to extremal things, not necessarily shortest things. And what we'll actually find is that in many contexts we're looking for the longest path. Which might seem weird, like, what do you mean by the longest path? But we'll talk explicitly about how that could even have a, a, a decent meaning. But what we'll discover is that in general relativity, the way you describe how a test particle moves is, you solve Einstein's equation to get the geometry of space-time, and then to figure out how a particle moves in that geometry, you literally take that geometry and say, what is the extremal path, that means the largest or smallest, the extremal path between here and here. Now we all know the trivial solution to that in really boring, flat, empty space, right? It's a straight line. It obviously gets more complicated if space-time is curved in ways that you might not really understand and appreciate, and that's what we're going to spend the bulk of this course sorting out. Okay? So just as a as sort of a comparison in broad strokes, we've got a perfect analogy between general relativity, what we do in general relativity, and what you've done in electromagnetism. We're going to develop the analog analogous equations to uh, Maxwell's equations, and these will be Einstein's equations, to even write them down we will have to develop a lot of interesting math. We will have to develop notions of tensors. We will have to develop notions of curvature. This will include notions of parallel transport, covariant derivatives. There's a lot of really, really nice stuff that's going to get developed just to write these down. And then a lot of the technology that goes into writing these down automatically gets folded into the geodesic equations. And so we'll write those down. I mean, the idea of a geodesic equation, I think, conceptually is pretty straightforward, but how you do it mathematically, especially given all the technology here, is the step that's not as obvious. And then, of course, what we want to do after we've written these two things down is we want to solve them. So um, the way the course is going to proceed is as follows. We're going to spend up until about spring break, maybe a little bit before, developing this and this. And again, you're going to learn a lot of ideas from differential geometry, tensor calculus. And what's really cool, and I, 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 can't, I can't overemphasize this, you're going to learn where a lot of the stuff you've been using all along actually comes from. For example, how many of you have looked at the beginning of, uh, what, what, e what e &M book did you guys use for intermediate e &M? Yeah. So when you open that up and you looked at the, the curl and the divergence in like spherical coordinates and you got those crazy whack formulas, okay, did you ever derive those? Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to see where all of those weird formulas come from. Why do things look weird in spherical polar coordinates? The machinery that we're going to develop to deal with curvature is actually going to immediately give you the answers to why those things look that way. Okay. Many of you probably walked in the door thinking you have an idea of what a vector is, right? 
You don't have any idea what a vector is. <laughs> That's okay, most physicists don't. I asked most physicists, I actually argued with Physics 100 people a couple semesters ago about what vectors were. There's this, this, I'm like, no. But I, you know. So you're gonna know what a vector is. You're gonna be so excited, you're gonna know what a vector is, yay. <laughs> um, but literally, we have to go back and we have to really carefully, very, very carefully scrutinize a lot of ideas you've been working with all along. The idea of coordinates, like what does it mean to write down a coordinate system? Okay, we have to carefully scrutinize all those ideas in order to generalize them. Because what you've been doing is you've been getting away with using simpler versions of things that just so happen to work when you're in flat, three-dimensional space, moving very slowly, okay? And that's, that's not the case we're gonna look at in this class. We're gonna be in four dimensions, we're gonna be in space time, and we're gonna have curvature. So you're gonna need more sophisticated versions of those very tools you've been working with all along. Um, and then, again, once we've kinda got all the meat down for this, then writing this down is not such a big deal. This part of the course is the most technical. It involves a lot of new ideas. Some people really like it. Some people are like, God, when this is gonna end, and it will end. <laughs> After we're done with this, because I, we have to be confident that this stuff is correct and makes sense. Because when we move to this part, you've gotta really believe this in order to accept what we get here. Because when we start trying to solve these things, that's when we're going to get to black holes and the Big Bang and stuff that a lot of people were really reticent to accept, okay? So it's my job, and, and when I talked about Hartle's undergraduate GR book earlier, what he does is he actually teaches you the solutions first because they're sexy, like black hole, yes! <laughs> you know, but I feel like it's, it's, it's bad business to just show you the solutions first and then go back and try and keep your attention to show you why all that stuff is actually true and where it comes from. So we're gonna go in this order, and this is the way Carol's book is, is developed as well. We're gonna spend our time getting into the meat of things, develop these things, and then for the entirety of after spring break and maybe a couple of lectures before that, we're going to explore solutions to those equations and we're gonna get all that wonderful wacky stuff with black holes and the Big Bang, gravitational waves, and so forth and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna end there today. Are there any questions before we get out of here? Yes? Do you guys figure out who you're going to hire for <laughs> your teaching faculty? <laughs> so, ooh, I'm actually very interested. Ooh. <laughs> ooh. I, I think I can say that. Because it's not like a secret anymore, because we've actually. Who is it? Yeah, we've hired her. Who do you think it is? Bill. Who? Who do you think it is? Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man, I feel like I should. Uh, whoa. Dr. Dr. Anna, 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 Emily, Daryl, and somebody else. Oh, it's not her. So yeah. Alana, Alana, Daryl, Emily, and Megan. Was it Megan? Yeah. I can't remember. Not Megan. Emily. Was her last name? Emily. Emily. What is she? Emily. Can't remember her last name. I can't remember Alana's last name. I can't remember Emily's last name. But we're hurrying Emily. So it's Emily. 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 Um, and she, she's like, it's, that's like done, she's accepted and everything, so we're, okay, cool. that's why I can say that. It's not like a contract and negotiation to the deal. Um, and she's going to start next fall. Okay. All right, uh, any other questions? <laughs> any real GR really? <laughs> Do okay, so wait, I have a question. Yeah. Do we turn in the homework or do we just take the homework? Okay, I'll just explain this to you because again, it's on the it's on the course website. I should have I usually send out an email and I don't really know why I didn't. Um, so the way it works like is like this. You're gonna do your homework, but I know what happens. I'm not dumb. <laughs> Some people don't do their homework. They write down other people's homework. It happens. I've seen it with my own eyes. I don't like that because I don't, you know, you're just handing something in and getting credit for that effort is A, it's not honest, but it's not doing you any good. I want you to engage the material. So what I've done is the following. You don't hand in your homework. I don't want you to. When you come in, there's going to be 15 minutes and there's going to be a two question quiz. One on the front, one on the back of a piece of paper. Those questions are written very similar to some of your, two of your homework problems. They're not the same, but they're similar too. 
such that if you actually did the homework or at very least got a copy of someone's and studied it, when you come in and sit down, you can bang out one of those problems in 15 minutes. You only have to do one of them. You don't have to do both. Do one or the other. Most people try both, but you only have to do one, okay? And the idea is that whether you do your homework or not, you're going to have to engage with the homework in order to come in and do well on those homework quizzes. The good thing about it is they get graded like within a day or two because it's just a little quiz instead of grading your homeworks. And I know graders are notorious for keeping grades, homeworks, you know, for really long periods of time and you don't get feedback. These things can get graded really quickly and handed back to you. And you're also never without your homework. Okay. So I think in the past, I don't know, the people who took Particle, you went through this, did it work okay? Well, you know you can't say no, I'm like putting you on the spot, but, <laughs> but I mean, generally I've been doing this for like six years and it's, it seemed to work really well for people. Um, and it's also, it kind, of, it kind of gets you out of that zone of, it's the long kappa zone, like I just need to get it done and turn it in and then you do a core dump. No, you, you're, the homework is not like a hoop you jump through to make me happy, it's part of your learning and engaging with it enough to where you can come in and take a little quiz. And by the way, you can use your homework on the quiz. Like you don't have to, like you can use your homework as you do the quiz. Okay, so you don't have to memorize your homework when you come in or anything like that. You just can't, you can't bring in the book and use it. Or Wikipedia. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, they're designed so that you can get them done in less than 15 minutes. Does that make, that make sense? And the homework is gonna constitute 50% of your grade. Class attendance will be 10%, and that's just if I draw your card or you hear and do you try. And then uh, you're going to have a midterm, an in-class midterm, which will be 20%, and then you'll have a take-home final, which will be 20%. And all of this is on the website. Okay, and again, if you're worried about like how hard the course is, this and that, you know, feel free to ask any of the people in here at Victor Particle or anybody that you know who's taken one of my classes. They're pitched at about the same level of effort. I realize this is an elective, this is not a core course for you. So I know you're not gonna put 30 hours into my course a week and I don't expect you to eat better places to put in that time. So I try and make as much happen as possible in here and then I try to make your homework assignments. I try to make your homework assignments reasonable. And I encourage you to work together on them. Okay, other questions? I'll see you guys next week.